listening to LUTG Radio's WKKP Digital Broadcasting. This is Kathy Brox. And today is January 12, 2016, and we're waiting as President Obama is about to make the presidential address at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 8 p.m. Central Time. Currently, uh, our Vice President Biden is speaking. So we'll go ahead and let you listen to some of that. I have one question. Do you genuinely mean what you say about restoring the middle class? I've always been referred to my whole career as middle class Joe. Down here, that's not meant as a compliment. It means you're not sophisticated. You think I'm kidding? I'm not. But I know the middle class. And I know why we are the nation we are. When the middle class does well, the poor have a way up and the wealthy do very well. That's the thing. Our growth of the notion of possibilities and growth in the middle class has been the social and political glue that's held this country together. And they're in trouble. They're in trouble. So the president, with all your help, has gotten us up on our feet now. We're starting to run, but now we got to finish the job. He said before, the single most significant need for the political system today is restore the middle class. And that's what this last year is about. Nailing this down. Part of it is getting big, big money out of politics. Can't we need amendments to do that? I introduced a constitutional amendment 35 years ago to do that. It didn't go anywhere, but we've got to shame people. We've got to shame people into making sure that they understand, that the public understands, that we, it says we the people, not we the contributors. That's how it starts off. No, I'm just I'm deadly earnest. You want to change one thing? We'll change the political system. Change the way we finance our elections. That will fundamentally change the system and give the middle class and the working class a fighting chance. There's so much, so much the president's going to talk about today. He's going to talk about the reasons why we should think about this. Why, why do we have presidential candidates on the other team talking about America being on the balls of its heel, America being down? We remain the most respected country in the world. We continue to lead the world. There's problems. They're real. And some of them are going to take time, but most of them are exaggerated. Exaggerated. We've got a lot of work to do. So what the president's going to talk about tonight is how we do that work, how we can do that work. We plan on finishing. We plan on finishing strong. And we finish. We want to make sure that we own the finish line. We, the United States of America, once again, own the finish line. Because when we do well, the rest of the world does much better. We do well. The rest of the world does much better. And let me just say that uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you, uh, the way you've treated my guy. Um, I, I, I mean this sincerely. Democrats. I, I, you know, I, uh, I think most everybody up there in both parties uh, uh, has an instinct to want to do good, good want to do well. Uh, you know, I learned a lesson. I'll conclude with this. I learned a lesson when I first got to the United States Senate. There was only one young, only one person younger than me ever elected to the United States Senate. And when I got there, it was uh, right after I got elected. State of Montana, who everybody respected, is enormous integrity. He came to me and said, "Look, you got to come. Just come for six months. You know, I am come for six months. Help us organize, and we'll get started." And uh, and I, I was so so dumb. We had 58 senators. He didn't need me to organize anything. And if I left, it would have a Democratic senator appointed my place. But I said, "Okay." And he had 
you come to his office every Tuesday and give me an assignment? And I didn't. I thought every freshman got an assignment from the majority leader. No, I. Look, I'm the first United States senator I ever knew. So it's, uh, you know, it was, uh, and so one day I'm walking in, it was in May, end of May, my first year, and I walked on the floor and a very conservative senator elected the same year I was, Jesse Helms from North Carolina, was excoriating Senator Bob Dole and Ted Kennedy for proposing the precursor to the Americans with Disabilities Act. But I had the meeting with the leader, and I just, I walked through the floor, and I went into my meeting, and I guess I looked angry. And he sat there and said, what's the matter? He spoke in clip tones, and what's the matter, Joe? And I said, I can't believe that, Jesse Helms. I said, he has no social redeeming value. He doesn't care about the handicap. He doesn't care. And it went on and on. He just got so frustrated. That's the first time somebody looked at me and said, Joe, what would you say if I told you I just got here? Christmas of 69, we're reading the Wally Observer in North Carolina, and there's a picture of a young man, I think he was 14 years old, and braces up to his hips with two kids, who said, all I want for Christmas is someone to love me and adopt me, take me to the home. I said, what would you say if I told you they adopted him? I said, no. I said, I feel like a jerk. He said, what did you do? He said, Joe, let me tell you what I did. It's always appropriate to question another man or woman judgment. It's never appropriate to question their motive because you don't know their motive. You may think you know their motive. What's happened today is we've gone from questioning each other's judgment where you can always end up resolving something. You can always get to a resolution. But if I say you're in the pocket of an interest group or you're not honest or you're this, it's awful hard to get to do Ladies and gentlemen, we're the most heterogeneous democracy in the world. We need to arrive at consensus. Consensus requires compromise. Compromise is almost impossible to reach when we make it a pitched war. We make it based upon our assessment of the other guys. That's what I'm counting on all of you to change. Change the tenor. Change the tone. America can not reach its potential unless we can reach a consensus. A consensus. That's what I personally presumptuously do this, is counting on. Argue the facts. Challenge the suppositions others make. us to be able when we walk out this door to say we couldn't think of anything else that we didn't try to do, that, that we didn't shy away from the challenge because it was hard, you know, that we weren't timid or got tired or uh, somehow we're thinking about the next thing because uh, there is no next thing. Uh, this is it and uh, never in our lives again will we have the chance to uh, do as much of good as we do right now. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, we maximize it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce the director of the Office of Public Engagement, Paulette Anderson. If you were there, you probably remember Cole first. Is that the first thing that comes across? 
If you were watching on television, you probably remember looking at people and thinking how cold it was. It was cold. But do you remember all of the optimism and possibility in the air? I am getting chills right now just thinking about it. Oh, it felt good. And I have to tell you, after seven years, I take a look at what we have accomplished and I am so proud. 90% of Americans have health care right now. The unemployment rate. The unemployment rate is 5%. We never thought we would see that in this decade. Amazing. We have got climate change agreements going on and people doing work in 50 states and 200 countries. It's amazing. Gay marriage, let's give it up for that. There is just so much hope and possibility still in the air. And if you had told me on my very first day in the White House when I had no idea what was going on and didn't know where to go to find my new class like it was college, I would have been so bursting with pride there at what we are going to be able to accomplish in the next seven years. And we still have an entire year left. And I will tell you, the president is so fired up, so fired up that he wanted to make sure that Edith was in the box tonight. So she is there to make sure that everybody else is fired up. And I will tell you that he has let us know how much he wants us to all just get in there in this last year and make it as big as last year was. 2015 is a really big year. And he wants each and every one of you to be a part of that. And he says every day, it's yes, we can. There are some big challenges ahead. He's going to talk about them at State of the Union tonight. Some of the big challenges we have for the next many decades. And he is expecting all of you to use this year and the next few decades to organize and get out there and help him make more change because there is still a lot to get done. So enjoy your night, but be ready to go to work tomorrow. We will see you out there. Thank you. We've gotten amazing things done over the last seven years. You think about yanking ourselves out of an economic crisis, putting people back to work, making sure that our manufacturing base is strong, dealing with big challenges like health care, education, uh, our environment. There's still some kid out there who can't afford to go, go to college. Uh, there's still uh, somebody out there who's looking for work uh, that needs to retrain and doesn't know how to get access to it. There's still uh, a veteran uh, who isn't getting the services that they need and that they've earned. You know, traditionally, State of the Unions, the President gets up and they give a long laundry list of things that they want to accomplish legislatively. Uh, I want to identify three or four big ideas, three or four big things that we have to focus on. A lot of what we can do is to change you know, the political environment and change people's attitudes and, and start uh, a process where uh, change begins to happen. Uh, it's a relay race, and it's important, though, you, that you get started. I want us to be able, when we walk out this door, to say uh, we couldn't think of anything else that we didn't try to do. If we can orient ourselves in the right way, then uh, I'm absolutely confident that we'll eventually get them accomplished and America will be better for it. Am I the only one uh, getting chills watching these videos? It's um, it's, it's almost kind of like a, a, a bittersweet moment. You know, I remember voting uh, for, the, for the then Senator Obama uh, the first time and, and to watch the elected the president and to watch these State of the Unions and to see it now, uh, you know, what we've done over the last few years and, and what we can accomplish. And uh, once again, Vice President Joe Biden, did you guys know that was happening? I mean, that, yeah, I came with a good surprise, right? It's pretty. And um, I, don't know, I don't know if any speaker is, is, is more motivating than him, 
you know, I mean, once he dropped the, the register and his voice and started talking, I, I feel motivated to do whatever he wants me to do. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, just, just what an incredible night. Uh, if, if you're just tuning in at home, once again, thank you so much for watching. We are here. We're enjoying each other's company. We're talking politics. We're talking policy. But more so than all of that, we're, we're, we're motivated. We're fired up. We're ready to go. And uh, we have a big night ahead of us as the president gets ready for his final State of the Union address here in D.C. All right, guys, uh, right now I'd like to introduce you to someone. Uh, the hashtag for you at home and for everyone that's here on your phone, I see you guys on your phone, use the hashtag uh, SOTU, S-O-T-U. Put that on your Instagram, your Twitter, your Snapchat, your Facebook. What am I missing? I don't know what I'm missing. Is there, is there anything else? The Periscope. There's a new Facebook thing. that has, I think there's a camera set up in my bedroom. I don't know where all these cameras are. Uh, but I'd like to introduce you to the chief digital officer who runs all of that for the White House, Jason Goldman. Please uh, come out to the stage. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much. Always difficult to follow the vice president, but happy to be here tonight. Uh, I run the White House Office of Digital Strategy, so we look after the uh, various White House social media accounts like Facebook. How many people follow us on Facebook here? All right. How about follow us on Twitter? Cool. How about how about follow us on Instagram? And just recently, we also launched the new White House Snapchat account. And just today, a few hours ago, we used Facebook Live for the first time from the Oval Office with the president talking about his remarks. All of these are part of a strategy that we talk about as meeting people where they are, which is that we feel that you should be able to choose how you want to interact with your government. That social media isn't about just broadcasting the message of government. It's about creating opportunities for you to engage and participate. And we think that you should have a choice of which way you want to choose to engage and participate. If that's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, on TV, whatever it is, we want to find a channel that works for you. The president in the video you just saw said that he doesn't want there to be an idea that we didn't try before we left. And we take that same approach in the Office of Digital Strategy. We want to try everything we can, every way we can think of uh, to connect you with the business of government, to make you feel more involved, to give you more opportunities to be engaged and be connected. So so please do tweet, do uh, talk to us with hashtag so to tonight. Share your opinions of the event you saw here. For these those of you watching at home, share your feelings about the, the State of the Union because we listen and that really does inform conversation. Now, I, it's my, also my honor to introduce tonight uh, our first musical guest of the evening. Uh, and it's, it's kind of an amazing thing because uh, this band last night was meant to conclude their tour on the Colbert Show, and they decided to extend it by one night to play the last gig of their tour here at the White House. So it's my tremendous honor to introduce you from here tonight at the White House, the band Elvi. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm Matt, that's Brent. Uh, I'm not sure why Brent wanted to come in a, a, a separate door. Brent's more theatrical than I am. Um, but thanks for having us. This is a, an incredible honor. Um, and uh, here we go.
trillion. Cause my relationship with God is more than a feeling. He ill in for a city, will kill us and villains be chilling. We're still in it, dealing. It's part of the everyday Chicago. living. He was real and they tried to kill me for being the realest. On the block was a GDP, these was TD and killers. I was affiliated, roll with BDs and the moles. A shout to the D's and of course I should shout to the stones. My Lord God. Right, y'all we got about uh 40 minutes before the president comes on but until then we got some music for you because you know we already we don't want to pay for those royalties for those songs so we're gonna play the ones that we authorized to play that's what we gonna do how many of y'all know that president obama is victorious yeah yeah everybody that's working with him they get the victory too and even those that ain't working with them they receiving the benefits so, you know they coming on over they coming on over they realizing that you know he 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 working for all of us amen but he ain't done oh yeah this is the seventh year and whatnot he about to go on out and do some going to the private sector but how many of y'all know he ain't done he ain't done yet uh-uh so what do you want you to do he wants us to get to back get back to doing that grassroots stuff. That's how he got into the office, into the office of the presidency. And he wants us to remember that we are victorious just because he's leaving office. That does not mean that he is done. And if he ain't done, we ain't done. All right? He's victorious, and so are we. You are victorious. Here's Nakia Young, victorious one.
baby. It's <laughs> what I do. It's who I am. God's child, what? That's Nakia Young. You can find her at NakiaYoung.com. All right. We're playing all positive music. Amen. As an intro to uh, President Obama's State of the Union address, his final one of his presidency. It's all good, though. We got to keep it going because how many of y'all know that his victory is because of what's on the inside of him? And that's the love of God. And what did that love do? It put his feet to the pavement and got him doing some grassroots stuff. Amen to help a nation. Yeah, yeah. His inside job by Miss Damara Chanel Underwood. It's Jesus being faithful to complete the inside job.
right. That's Damara Chanel Underwood. You can find her on Facebook. And she is also a Howard University graduate. And she also performed, in addition to many of the different places that she she performs, like uh, Philadelphia Philharmonic, I believe. But she also performed for the President of the United States and Michelle Obama with her class, her, uh, cla- a chorus class, when she was in high school. So... I'm sorry. I believe it's she performed with her class. So <laughs> I would I would I'm not sure if it's exactly high school if it was college, but I do know that she performed for them. It wasn't a short. It was but a short time ago, and uh, she's basically not even 25 yet, and she's been performing since about age 11. I'm telling you, the girl is blessed. Let's keep it going with Miss um Miss uh, Sheila Moore Piper. Get excited. We got about 29 more minutes before President Obama gives his address. Amen. A State of the Union address. That was Get Excited by Miss Sheila Moore Piper. You can find her at SheilaMoorePiper.com. SheilaMoorePiper.com. Okay, so I have a correction for you. Demara Chanel, uh, I don't see that she played the Philharmonic Philadelphia um, 
uh, Phil Armani. But you'll see why I got that little confused. Um, she has more than 20 performances here, and I'm sure this is not even all of them. So she played. She performed on Bobby Jones' uh, Gospel. This is when she was around 11. Uh, K KDKA TV, the Pittsburgh Today Show. Mike Tomlin, the head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers, a Pittsburgh welcoming dinner. The Children's Hospital fundraiser. Uh, the male blunt celebrity roast. First Lady, Mrs. Michelle Obama, G20 Summit at the Kappa High School. See, I told you she was there. And then <laughs> we have uh, Hillary Clinton, Heinz Field, uh, Dan Honorado, County Executive of the Allegheny County Inauguration, Soldiers and Sailors Hall, NAACP Dinner, the Urban League of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Federal Ex Executive Board, a Highmark Blue Cross Health Walk, the Trinity Broadcast Network, the a AFL CIO, <laughs> the Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania, the Bowles Lodge. I mean, this girl has been performing tons of places. So if I got one wrong, forgive me. It'll be all right. All right. Up next is Tay Spears, Chicago's own Tay Spears. His song is right here. You can get his music at Tay Spears Music um, on Facebook. So it's facebook.com forward slash Tay Spears Music. T A E. S-P-E-A-R-S. -E Amen. And his YouTube video is on YouTube, and it's called Right Here. Of course, DJ Wado, Tay Spears, the mixtape volume one. At Tay underscore Spears on that yeah. Twitter, that Instagram. Yo, I heard they was looking for me. I did too. Yeah. It's Xavier. Well, homie, I'm right here. Jordan. Let's do it. Yeah. You looking for me? They looking? Yeah. Well, I'm right here. Yeah. You looking for me? Well, homie, yeah, I'm right here. They looking well I'm right here, yeah, I'm right here. You looking for me? Yeah, they looking yeah, for me while well, I'm right here. Yeah, I'm right here. You looking for me? Yeah, they looking well, I'm right here. Right here. You looking for me? Yeah, yeah, homie, while well, I'm right here. Right here. You looking for me? Yeah, uh, well, I'm right here. Yeah, I'm right here. You looking for me? Uh, yeah, homie, while well, I'm right here. Streets, I'm a suspect. suspect. Riding with them killers that they own flesh. flesh. Many go hard for that big check. I do it for my guys. So, homie, I'm a misfit. Yeah. Riding with my dogs in the streets like I live there. Okay. Walking with them goons, they don't see fear. Uh -huh. Give them that word while they standing on the curb, selling loud. They don't expect for me to be here. Yeah. Take it to the porch, they ain't rushing to the church. Oh, yeah. my Lord, they luck, so me, you gon' get this work. Show yeah. them how they flawed and it only gets worse. Why they think yeah. it's all good, gotta hit them where it hurts. Okay. Need a savior that can come and show you worth. Show God can intervene while you sipping on the purse. Yeah. You can sip and lean, but you can't try to hurt. God wants you on his team, but you need to put him first. Put the Lord first. Cause your status don't matter. What matters is after you die, will it catch up with you being stuck in this simple disaster when you had the chance to commune with the master? My God won't be mocked all this laughter and chatter when you see the son that was beaten and battered and killed for your sins, but you choose to seek after the ways of this world, so then hell's the next chapter. Yeah. So choose you this day, thinking I'm bold, will he made me this way? This is no game, no, I don't come to play. You gon' get that word if you looking for me. Yeah. Choose you this day, yeah. thinking I'm bold, well, he made me this hey. way. This is no game, no, I don't come Free to play. Man. You gon' get that word if you looking for me. Yeah, yeah. you looking for me? They looking? Yeah, well, I'm right here. You looking for me? Well, homie, yeah, I'm right here. Yeah, you looking for me? They looking? Well, I'm right here. Yeah, I'm right here. You looking for me? Yeah, they looking for me. Yeah, homie, well, I'm right here. Yeah, I'm right here. You looking for me? Yeah, they looking. Well, I'm right here. You looking for me? Yeah, yeah, homie, well, I'm right here. Yeah, I'm right here. You looking for me? Yeah, well, I'm right here. Yeah, I'm right here. You looking for me? Yeah. Yeah, well, right word on the streets, I'm a suspect. Yeah, Riding with them killers that they own flesh. Uh -huh. Many go hard for that big check. I do it for my guy, so homie, I'm a misfit. Riding yeah. with my dogs in the streets like I live there. Yeah. Walking with them goons, they don't see fear. Okay. Give them that word while they standing on the curb, yeah. selling loud. Yeah. They don't yeah. for me to be yeah. here. Take yeah. it to the porch, they ain't rushing to the church. Oh, my Lord, they luck, so me, you gon' get this work. Show them how they flawed and it only gets worse. While okay. they think it's all good, gotta hit them where it hurts. Need yeah. a savior that can come and show you worth. Show you God worth. can intervene while you sipping on the purse. You be sipping lean, but you can't.
ain't trying to hurt God. Want you on his team, but you need to put him first. Put the Lord first. Cause your status don't matter. What matters is after you die, will it catch up with you being stuck in this sinful disaster when you had the chance to commune with the master? God won't be mocked all that laughter and chatter when you see the son that was beaten and battering. Kill for your sins, but you choose to seek after the ways of this world so then hell's the next chapter. Yo, so choose you to stay. Thinking I'm poor, will he made me that way? This is no game, no, I don't come to play. You gon' get that word if you lookin' for me. Yeah, so choose you to stay. Thinking I'm poor, will he made me that way? This is no game, no, I don't come to play. You gon' get that word if you lookin' for me. Yeah, you lookin' for me? They lookin' for me? Well, I'm right here. You lookin' for me? Well, homie, yeah, I'm right here. You lookin' for me? They lookin' Well, I'm right here. Yeah, I'm right here. You lookin' for me? Yeah, they lookin' for me. Yeah, homie, well, I'm right here. You looking for me? Yeah, they looking. Well, well I'm right here. Right here. Yeah, right here. You looking for me? Yeah, yeah, homie. Well, I'm right here. Right here. You looking for me? Yeah. Well, I'm right here. Yeah, I'm right here. You looking for me? Oh, yeah, homie. Well, I'm right here. Right here.
I got saved, I don't do what I used to do The devil hate that, my soul, he wanna take that As long as I keep God on my side, he better stay back Cause I begin the word, Jesus Christ is who I serve Before I met him, I was all in the world I was all about the girls in the table When turn. I was driving down that interstate Kept living that wrong way Kept doing my own thing Till I drove right into harm's way Anyway, this is how the story goes God saved me when I was down and low Not hot but cold, I never sell my soul Cause hell is where I can't go I be in the world We be chopping down He will tell you okay. I'm gifted with this pen And like the pen that we be winning My head above water Michael fuck with how I'm swimming Yeah, let him know yeah. Y'all yeah. the Christ yeah. Yeah. with it It's like him sinning Okay, yeah. I see the truth That's principle Righteous mind and my actions back it I belong to no institute Speaking code and hope that you crack it Wise man and my gifts I bear Shine a light for those lost out there Fear no longer holds my heart If they mad at me Well, look, I don't care Church, no longer waste my time Life, that's what goes on outside If you only know God for the of a preacher, and you probably don't know him at all. I'm fine. Time, how we no longer waste, make a difference in the lives that I'm close to. Post to climb, religious days stuck in time. So I let the rhetoric back to the back. I'm gone. I be in the world. Yeah. We be chopping down fear. Keep your eye on him. You will never drown here. I'm so full of faith. Get this through your round ear. Hope you say back race before you hear that sound clear. Man of God. I'm sure enough that I got that glow. Put me in the middle when I feel with a mouth. God rain down the whole world, go no. Take close heed to the words I say. I am he when they in my way. Y'all gon' bleep when the rap shit hit. Then the world gon' think that we in my A. Go, fly, party. I be on my green like an omnivore. Me, like, no. I feel richy like a Commodore. It ain't no thing for me to pay my time, but I may offer more. Christian, I am that. When I come in full contact, then I conquer more. Crucified, he hung up. Now, no, that's really mean. They denied the sunshine. Like MJ did to Billy Jean. Love him cause he ain't y'all. Breaking down on great walls. God and me, I can't fall. Them bullets feel like paintball. I be in the world. We be chopping down fear. Keep your eye on him. You will never drown here. I'm so full of faith. Get this through your round ear. Hope you say back race. Before you hear that sound clear. Man of God. Yeah, I like that. When he send them out, they come right back. Sheep amongst the wolves, but they fight back. Oh, you be in your word. Yeah, I like that. All right. That was Cell Block, man of God. Amen. Cell Block with um, Anub. Anyway, we'll just say Cell Block, man of God. Featuring the sons, uh, I can't even see the whole thing. Hold on. Anyway, moving on. I'll tell you the whole thing, but just think. Remember, cell block. C e l l b l o k. Cell block. You can look him up on Twitter, Facebook, anywhere in the internet. Uh, that previous song was called "Free to Be Me" by Miss Shawana Hayes. You always hear me talk about her all the time on the show. And you can find her at shawanahayes.com. Up next, here's Legacy Music. Y'all know the motto. Last call. DJ, turn it all off the upper shelf. Living water in my cup. Roof on fire, man. Pull up in the fire truck. Firefighter rocking now. Keep this party fired up. Fired up, fired up. I'ma get you wired up. Red Bull flow, but those men can't get you high. No, stacking up blessing. Watch them as they pile up. Special delivery. Respect the messenger. Don't keep it on the low. Got too much to say. You know, I will always get my out. Never sell 
now that's a none of a million like logo Going crazy like bozo, I haven't seen nothing yet Nah, this is just a promo I don't know how you came in But by the time you leave I know you're gonna feel better This is not just another night This is a night where we all come together and let go It's time that I let you know Nothing is impossible And as I pop these bottles and the vibes that's the flow in this place here's a taste of his grace pour it up pour it up praise to the most high you know what's up you know what's up all i need is my jesus oh my god lift him up live in water drink it up live in water drink it up lift him up lift him up since the beginning of the night
watching the fight. That last song was by Stronghold. Answer the call before that. Legacy music. Right now we have the State of the Union presidential address about to get underway. Okay, uh, President Obama has not appeared yet. Uh, so the, I should tell you that the song before that was um, Shawana. I actually, I gave you that. Shawana Hayes. I just want to be sure that I mentioned that. All righty. Let's see what's going on. Uh-oh. All right, now I see Michelle Obama coming down. They were, okay, looks like he's going to, she is sitting with Mrs. Biden. You guys can probably can hear the applause. But, uh, yep, she's uh, sitting with uh, Mrs. Joe Biden. Oh, she looks great, you guys. All them push-ups are working. Go on, girl. She has on a beautiful gold dress. All right. And uh, Mrs. Biden has, that's Michelle Obama, and Mrs. Biden has on a pink dress. All righty. The house is full tonight. Oh, her hair is gorgeous. All right. Amen. We're about to receive. All right. The presidential cabinet. All right, get the Secretary of State. Looks like everybody's in attendance here. If you remember, Kerry ran, he's the Secretary of State, and he ran for president uh, a few years ago. I think it was in 2008. Hold on a second. Let's see who else is coming up. Hold on. Oh, everybody's taking pictures. <laughs> All right, so we're waiting for them to take their seats. That's the presidential cabinet. They're taking their seats. We're, you know, shaking hands. I guess they haven't seen people in a while. And also, I guess some of these folks, well, of course, they're onlookers, probably employees and the constituents. Let's see here. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, while we're waiting for them, Hold on, wait. The president should be coming shortly. I didn't want to play any music and have him come through. We miss it. He sh he usually comes right after them. They just need to sit down. You know how you don't want to rush to class to sit down, but in this case, you know, sit down. <laughs> All righty. We'll be patient. They'll get to it. They'll get to it. You know how it is when you ain't seen somebody in a while. You be like, hey, man, how you doing? God bless you. All right, all right. How's the family? <laughs> all right, all right. All right, all right. Hugs and kisses. Yeah, you know we love you. You know we love you. I'm just, <laughs> this is my commentation on what I think they may be saying. All right, God bless you. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, how's the family? Beautiful children. Love your children. They're just gorgeous, huh? How's so and so doing in school? All right. That's right. That's that's good. They're doing good. All right, all right. Keep up the good work. They may be the next president. All right, all right. <laughs> all right, so we're still waiting for them to do their thing. Amen. Amen. Let's see here. It is uh eight oh two, so the president should be speaking in a few in a few minutes here. Everybody's still giving their hugs and kisses. 
Mm. Wow. It's amazing that these people are actually friends. You know, sometimes they always seem like they're on opposite sides of the political field when really it's all one government and one country. Sometimes it feels like two and three different countries. But um, they're friends. They're shaking hands, hugging, kissing. Oh, how you doing? Uh-huh. We're going to play golf, all right, y'all? <laughs> just in case you guys just tuned in, this is Kathy Brox with LUTG Radio's WKKP Digital Broadcasting, Chicago, Illinois. And uh, the presidential cabinet just came in. And so I'm just basically mimicking, well, making fun of what I think they may be saying, you know, just anticipating their conversation. Uh-oh, we have a young lady in a red dress. Gone, girl. A 1950s dress. Those dresses were on target. Amen. Bet you if you pull one of those out of your closet, it would look fresh. I saw a suit today, a man's suit. It was a 1905 series. It really was a 1905 cut. And it looked very relevant. So that, that, that dress that she has on, it stands out. And it picks up the t- The TV picks up that color really well. So, Wow. Wow. You know, Michelle's dress is a gold dress. I don't know if that's one of the colors that the TVs pick up very well, but it shows well on her. Gorgeous. You know, so, you know, when you pan a crowd, some colors just kind of fade in. But red and black and white are the three colors that really pick up well. But uh, evidently, gold picks up well, too. As Michelle's the dress looks great. Love it. But she always looks good. Go on, girl. She's she's a lawyer. She's a mother. She's a wife. And 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 she's a fashionista. Go on, girl. Hey. Public speaker. Hey man, go on, girl. The girl is a thinker. Hey man. Trendsetter. Inspiration motivator. Michelle Obama. Now, uh, Mrs. Biden, she ain't short now. She, uh, She's a doctor. She's an educator. She's a wife. All right now. She's a mom. Go ahead, girl. The ladies are ruling it. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. All right. All right. So we're still waiting on President Obama. So I'm going to see if I can play a song while we're waiting. Amen. Amen. Here's Skylar Kalen. Take control. Okay, they just announced the president of the United States. All right, all right. He'll, he's making his way through the crowd. There he is. I see him. <laughs> Got him a fresh haircut. <laughs> all right, all right. They say that he was going to have more gray in his hair. Maybe a little bit more than he had when he first started, but it looks good. It looks good because he keeps it fresh. Go ahead. Here you have another lawyer, educator, man that loves people. Amen. Loves doing for the folks. Go ahead. Go ahead. All these smart people in one room. What a blessing. Go ahead, Mr. President. All right. All right. This may be his final State of the Union address, but you know what? This ain't his final speech. He going to keep on rolling. He got more to say. We got more to do. Amen, amen. He's inspiring the next presidents of the United States. Go ahead, go ahead. All right, so they still kissing on each other here. Amen, amen. Going to give it a couple minutes. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Okay, we, I guess we can wait a few more minutes. Oh, all right. They trying to get him, move him through the crowd. <laughs> 
that must be difficult guarding the president because you got to keep him moving, keep him moving, and you got to do it in a way that is not offensive to other people. <laughs> you got to tell the folks, all right, we got to keep it moving, keep it moving. <laughs> I think we forget that he doesn't always get a chance to see everybody. <laughs> That's so cool, though. Awesome. Awesome. You know, he's a really good networker. This dude, he, I mean, the president has a really good communication skills. He can walk into a room and negotiate with just about anybody in the room, figure out a way to solve everybody's problems. That's pretty cool. That's a really good skill to have. That just that means that you're humble, and you, you're wise. You not you don't always have to win everything that you know that you have on your plate. You're willing to share, so that's pretty cool. That's a sign of wisdom, humility. Go ahead, amen, amen. Go ahead, man. See, that's why he's the president two times in a row. Look out! All right, all right. Amen, amen. All right, y'all. <laughs> All right. Here he come. He's stepping up to the podium. It's your blessed self. Go ahead, Mr. President. All right. He's shaking Joe Biden's hand. All right. The final State of the Union address. So do. I mean, so too. So too. That's the uh, hashtag. So too. State of the Union all right all right lots of clapping amen amen glory to god if you can hear you hear lots and lots and lots and lots of uh clapping all right i'm gonna shut up now lutg radios wkkp digital broadcasting state of the union address by president obama final one january 12 2016 Amen, amen. He's still all right. All righty. Amen, amen. Call to order. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Vice President, members of Congress, my fellow Americans. Tonight marks the eighth year that I've come here to report on the State of the Union. And for this final one, I'm going to try to make it a little shorter. I know some of you answered to get back to Iowa. I've been there. I'll be shaking hands afterwards if you want some tips. Uh, I understand that because it's an election season, expectations for what we will achieve this year are low. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the constructive approach that you and other leaders took at the end of last year to pass a budget and make tax cuts permanent for working families. So I hope we can work together this year on some bipartisan priorities like criminal justice reform and helping <laughs> and helping people who are battling prescription drug abuse and heroin abuse. So, who knows, we might surprise the cynics again. But tonight, 
I want to go easy on the traditional list of proposals for the year ahead. Don't worry, I've got plenty. From helping students learn to write computer code to personalizing medical treatments for patients, and I will keep pushing for progress on the work that I believe still needs to be done. Fixing a broken immigration system. <laughs> Protecting our kids from gun violence. Equal pay for equal work. Paid leave. Raising the minimum wage. All these things, all these things still matter to hardworking families. They're still the right thing to do. And I won't let up until they get done. But for my final address to this chamber, I don't want to just talk about next year. I want to focus on the next five years, the next 10 years, and beyond. I want to focus on our future. We live in a time of extraordinary change. Change that's reshaping the way we live, the way we work, our planet, our place in the world. It's change that promises amazing medical breakthroughs, but also economic disruptions that strain working families. It promises education for girls in the most remote villages, but also connects terrorists plotting an ocean away. It's change that can broaden opportunity or widen inequality. And whether we like it or not, the pace of this change will only accelerate. America's been through big changes before. Wars and depression, the influx of new immigrants, workers fighting for a fair deal, movements to expand civil rights. Each time, there have been those who told us to fear the future, who claimed we could slam the brakes on change, who promised to restore past glory if we just got some group or idea that was threatening America under control. And each time, we overcame those fears. We did not, in the words of Lincoln, adhere to the dogmas of the quiet past. Instead, we thought anew and acted anew. We made change work for us, always extending America's promise outward to the next frontier, to more people. And because we did, because we saw opportunity with a, where others saw peril, we emerged stronger and better than before. What was true then can be true now. Our unique strengths as a nation, our optimism and work ethic, our spirit of discovery, our diversity, our commitment to rule of law, these things give us everything we need to ensure prosperity and security for generations to come. In fact, it's in that spirit that we have made progress these past seven years. That's how we recovered from the worst economic crisis in generations. That's how we reformed our health care system and reinvented our energy sector. That's how, that's, how we, that's how we delivered more care and benefits to our troops coming home and our veterans. That's how we... That's, that's how we secured the freedom in every state to marry the person we love.
But, but such progress is not inevitable. It's the result of choices we make together. And we face such choices right now. Will we respond to the changes of our time with fear, turning inward as a nation, turning against each other as a people? Or will we face the future with confidence in who we are, in what we stand for, and the incredible things that we can do together? So let's talk about the future and four big questions that I believe we as a country have to answer, regardless of who the next president is or who controls the next Congress. First, how do we give everyone a fair shot at opportunity and security in this new economy? Second, how do we make technology work for us and not against us, especially when it comes to solving urgent challenges like climate change? Third, how do we keep America safe and lead the world without becoming its policeman? And finally, how can we make our politics reflect what's best in us? and not what's worse. Let me start with the economy and a basic fact. The United States of America, right now, has the strongest, most durable economy in the world. We're in the middle of the longest streak of private sector job creation in history. More than 14 million new jobs, the strongest two years of job growth since the 1990s, an unemployment rate cut in half. Our auto industry just had its best year ever. That's just part of a manufacturing surge that's created nearly 900,000 new jobs in the past six years. And we've done all this while cutting our deficits by almost three quarters. Anyone claiming that America's economy is in decline is peddling fiction. Now, What is true, and the reason that a lot of Americans feel anxious, is that the economy has been changing in profound ways. Changes that started long before the Great Recession hit, changes that have not let up. Today, technology doesn't just replace jobs on the assembly line, but any job where work can be automated. Companies in a global economy can locate anywhere, and they face tougher competition. As a result, workers have less leverage for a raise. Companies have less loyalty to their communities. And more and more wealth and income is concentrated at the very top. All these trends have squeezed workers, even when they have jobs even when the economy is growing. It's made it harder for a hard-working family to pull itself out of poverty, harder for young people to start their careers, tougher for workers to retire when they want to. And although none of these trends are unique to America, they do offend our uniquely American belief that everybody who works hard should get a fair shot. 
For the past seven years, our goal has been a growing economy that also works better for everybody. We've made progress, but we need to make more. And despite all the political arguments that we've had these past few years, there are actually some areas where Americans broadly agree. We agree that real opportunity requires every American to get the education and training they need to land a good paying job. The bipartisan reform of No Child Left Behind was an important start. And together we've increased early childhood education, lifted high school graduation rates to new highs, boosted graduates in fields like engineering. In the coming years, we should build on that progress by providing pre-K for all and offering every student Offering every student the hands-on computer science and math classes that make them job ready on day one. We should recruit and support more great teachers for our kids. And, and we have to make college affordable for every American. No hardworking student should be stuck in the red. We've already reduced student loan payments by, uh, to 10 percent of a borrower's income, and that's good. But now we've actually got to cut the cost of college. <laughs> Providing two years of community college at no cost for every responsible student is one of the best ways to do that, and I'm going to keep fighting to get that started this year. It's the right thing to do. But a great education isn't all we need in this new economy. We also need benefits and protections that provide a basic measure of security. It's not too much of a stretch to say that some of the only people in America who are going to work the same job in the same place with a health and retirement package for 30 years are sitting in this chamber. For everyone else, especially folks in their 40s and 50s, saving for retirement or bouncing back from job loss has gotten a lot tougher. Americans understand that at some point in their careers, in this new economy, they may have to retool, they may have to retrain, but they shouldn't lose what they've already worked so hard to build in the process. That's why Social Security and Medicare are more important than ever. We shouldn't weaken them, we should strengthen them. And for Americans short of retirement, basic benefits should be just as mobile as everything else is today. That, by the way, is what the Affordable Care Act is all about. It's about filling the gaps in employer-based care so that when you lose a job, or you go back to school, or you strike out and launch that new business, you'll still have coverage. Nearly 18 million people have gained coverage so far. And in the process, in the process, health care inflation has slowed, and our businesses have created jobs every single month since it became law. Now, uh, I'm guessing we won't agree on health care anytime soon. But, <laughs> oh, applause right there. <laughs> Just a guess. But there should be other ways parties can work together to improve economic security. Say a hardworking American loses his job. 
we shouldn't just make sure that he can get unemployment insurance. We should make sure that program encourages him to retrain for a business that's ready to hire him. If that new job doesn't pay as much, there should be a system of wage insurance in place so that he can still pay his bills. And even if he's going from job to job, he should still be able to save for retirement and take his savings with him. That's the way we make the new economy work better for everybody. I also know Speaker Ryan has talked about his interest in tackling poverty. America is about giving everybody willing to work a chance, a hand up. And I'd welcome a serious discussion about strategies we can all support, like expanding tax cuts for low-income workers who don't have children. But there are some areas where we just have to be honest. It has been difficult to find agreement over the last seven years. And a lot of them fall under the category of what role the government should play in making sure the system's not rigged in favor of the wealthiest and biggest corporations. And it's an honest disagreement. And the American people have a choice to make. I believe a thriving private sector is the lifeblood of our economy. I think there are outdated regulations that need to be changed. There is red tape that needs to be cut. There you go. Yeah. See? But after years now of record corporate profits, working families won't get more opportunity or bigger paychecks just by letting big banks or big oil or hedge funds make their own rules at everybody else's expense. The middle Middle class families are not going to feel more secure because we allowed a tax on collect, uh, collective bargaining to go unanswered. Food stamp recipients did not cause the financial crisis. Recklessness on Wall Street did. Immigrants aren't the principal reason wages haven't gone up. Those decisions are made in the boardrooms that all too often put quarterly earnings over long-term returns. It's sure not the average family watching tonight that avoids paying taxes through offshore accounts. The point is, I believe, that in this new economy, workers and startups and small businesses need more of a voice, not less. The rules should work for them. And I'm not alone in this. This year I plan to lift up the many businesses who figured out that doing right by their workers or their customers or their communities ends up being good for their shareholders. And I want to spread those best practices across America. That's part of a brighter future. In fact, it turns out many of our best corporate citizens are also our most creative. And this brings me to the second big question we as a country have to answer. How do we reignite that spirit of innovation to meet our biggest challenges? Sixty years ago, when the Russians beat us into space, we didn't deny Sputnik was up there. We didn't argue about the science or shrink our research and development budget. We built a space program almost overnight, and 12 years later, we were walking on the moon. That spirit 
of discovery is in our DNA. America is Thomas Edison and the Wright brothers and George Washington Carver. America's Grace Hopper and Katherine Johnson and Sally Ride. America is every immigrant and entrepreneur from Boston to Austin to Silicon Valley racing to shape a better future. That's who we are. And over the past seven years, we've nurtured that spirit. We've protected an open internet and taken bold new steps to get more students and low-income Americans online. We've launched next-generation manufacturing hubs and online tools that give an entrepreneur everything he or she needs to start a business in a single day. But we can do so much more. You know, last year, Vice President Biden said that with a new moonshot, America can cure cancer. Last month, he worked with this Congress to give scientists at the National Institutes of Health the strongest resources that they've had in over a decade. Well, so, so tonight I'm announcing a new national effort to get it done. And because he's gone to the mat for all of us on so many issues over the past 40 years, I'm putting Joe in charge of mission control. For the loved ones we've all lost, for the families that we can still save, let's make America the country that cures cancer once and for all. What do you say, Joe? Let's make it happen. Now, medical research is critical. We need the same level of commitment when it comes to developing clean energy sources. Look, if anybody still wants to dispute the science around climate change, have at it. You will be pretty lonely because you'll be debating our military, most of America's business leaders, the majority of the American people, almost the entire scientific community, and 200 nations around the world who agree it's a problem and intend to solve it. But, but even if, even if the planet wasn't at stake, even if 2014 wasn't the warmest year on record, until 2015 turned out to be even hotter, why would we want to pass up the chance for American businesses to produce and sell the energy of the future? Listen. 7 years ago we made the single biggest investment in clean energy in our history. Here are the results. In fields from Iowa to Texas, wind power is now cheaper than dirtier conventional power. On rooftops from Arizona to New York, solar is saving Americans tens of millions of dollars a year on their energy bills and employs more Americans than coal in jobs that pay better than average. We're taking steps to give homeowners the freedom to generate and store their own energy, something, by the way, that environmentalists and Tea Partiers have teamed up to support. And meanwhile, we've cut our imports of foreign oil by nearly 60 percent and cut carbon pollution more than any other country on Earth. <laughs> Gas under two bucks a gallon ain't bad either. Now we've got to accelerate the transition away from old, dirtier energy sources. 
Rather than subsidize the past, we should invest in the future, especially in communities that rely on fossil fuels. We do them no favor when we don't show them where the trends are going. And that's why I'm going to push to change the way we manage our oil and coal resources so that they better reflect the cost they impose on taxpayers and our planet. And that way we put money back into those communities and put tens of thousands of Americans to work building a 21st century transportation system. Now, none of this is going to happen overnight. And yes, there are plenty of entrenched interests who want to protect the status quo. But the jobs will create, the money will save, the planet will preserve. That is the kind of future our kids and our grandkids deserve. And it's within our grasp. And climate change is just one of many issues where our security is linked to the rest of the world. And that's why the third big question that we have to answer together is how to keep America safe and strong without either isolating ourselves or trying to nation build everywhere there's a problem. I told you earlier, all the talk of America's economic decline is political hot air. Well, so is all the rhetoric you hear about our enemies getting stronger and America getting weaker. Let me, let me tell you something. The United States of America is the most powerful nation on earth, period. Period. It's not even close. It's not even close. It's not even close. We spend more on our military than the next eight nations combined. Our troops are the finest fighting force in the history of the world. No nation attacks us directly or our allies because they know that's the path to ruin. Surveys show our standing around the world is higher than when I was elected to this office and when it comes to every important international issue. People of the world do not look to Beijing or Moscow to lead, they call us. So, I think it's useful to level set here. Because when we don't, we don't make good decisions. Now, as someone who begins every day with an intelligence briefing, I know this is a dangerous time. But that's not primarily because of some looming superpower out there, and it's certainly not because of diminished American strength. In today's world, we're threatened less by evil empires and more by failing states. The Middle East is going through a transformation that will play out for a generation, rooted in conflicts that date back millennia. Economic headwinds are blowing in from a Chinese economy that is in significant transition. Even as their economy severely contracts, Russia is pouring resources in to prop up Ukraine and Syria, client states that they saw slipping away from their orbit. And the international system we built after World War II is now struggling to keep pace with this new reality. It's up to us, the United States of America, to help remake that system. And to do that well, it means that we've got to set priorities. 
Priority number one is protecting the American people and going after terrorist networks. Both Al-Qaeda and now ISIL pose a direct threat to our people because in today's world, even a handful of terrorists who place no value on human life, including their own, can do a lot of damage. They use the Internet to poison the minds of individuals inside our country. Their actions undermine and destabilize our allies. We have to take them out. But as we focus on destroying ISIL, over-the-top claims that this is World War III just play into their hands. Masses of fighters on the back of pickup trucks, twisted souls plotting in apartments or garages, they pose an enormous danger to civilians. They have to be stopped. But they do not threaten our national existence. That, that is the story ISIL wants to tell. That's the kind of propaganda they use to recruit. We don't need to build them up to show that we're serious. And we sure don't need to push away vital allies in this fight by echoing the lie that ISIL is somehow representative of one of the world's largest religions. We just need to call them what they are, killers and fanatics, who have to be rooted out, hunted down, and destroyed. And that's exactly what we're doing. For more than a year, America has led a coalition of more than 60 countries to cut off ISIL's financing, disrupt their plots, stop the flow of terrorist fighters and stamp out their vicious ideology. With nearly 10,000 airstrikes, we're taking out their leadership, their oil, their training camps, their weapons. We're training, arming, and supporting forces who are steadily reclaiming territory in Iraq and Syria. If this Congress is serious about winning this war and wants to send a message to our troops and the world, authorize the use of military force against ISIL. Take a vote. Take a vote. But the American people should know that with or without congressional action, ISIL will learn the same lessons as terrorists before them. If you doubt America's commitment or mine to see that justice is done, just ask Osama bin Laden. <laughs> ask, ask the leader of Al Qaeda in Yemen, who was taken out last year, or the perpetrator of the Benghazi attacks, who sits in a prison cell. When you come after Americans, we go after you. And it may take time, but we have long memories, and our reach has no limits. Our foreign policy has to be focused on the threat from ISIL and al-Qaeda. But it can't stop there. For even without ISIL, even without al-Qaeda, instability will continue for decades in many parts of the world, in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, in parts of Pakistan, in parts of Central America, and Africa, and Asia. Some of these places may become safe havens for new terrorist networks. Others will just fall victim to ethnic conflict or famine. 
feeding the next wave of refugees. The world will look to us to help solve these problems. And our answer needs to be more than tough talk or calls to carpet bomb civilians. That may work as a TV soundbite, but it doesn't pass muster on the world stage. We also can't try to take over and rebuild every country that falls into crisis, even if it's done with the best of intentions. That's not leadership. That's a recipe for quagmire, spilling American blood and treasure that ultimately will weaken us. It's the lesson of Vietnam. It's the lesson of Iraq, and we should have learned it by now. Fortunately, there is a smarter approach, a patient and disciplined strategy that uses every element of our national power. It says America will always act, alone if necessary, to protect our people and our allies. But on issues of global concern, we will mobilize the world to work with us and make sure other countries pull their own weight. That's our approach to conflicts like Syria, where we're partnering with local forces and leading international efforts to help that broken society pursue a lasting peace. That's why we built a global coalition with sanctions and principled diplomacy to prevent a nuclear-armed Iran. And as we speak, Iran has rolled back its nuclear program, shipped out its uranium stockpile, and the world has avoided another war. That's how, that's how we stopped the spread of Ebola in West Africa. Our military, our doctors, our development workers, they were heroic. They set up the platform that then allowed other countries to join in behind us and stamp out that epidemic. Hundreds of thousands, maybe a couple million lives were saved. That's how we forged a trans-Pacific partnership to open markets and protect workers and the environment and advance American leadership in Asia. It cuts 18,000 taxes on products made in America, which will then support more good jobs here in America. With TPP, China does not set the rules in that region. We do. You want to show our strength in this new century? Approve this agreement. Give us the tools to enforce it. It's the right thing to do. Let me give you another example. Fifty years of isolating Cuba had failed to promote democracy. It set us back in Latin America. That's why we restored diplomatic relations, opened the door to travel and commerce, positioned ourselves to improve the lives of the Cuban people. So if you want to consolidate our leadership and credibility in the hemisphere, Recognize that the Cold War is over. Lift the embargo. The, po the point is, American leadership in the 21st century is not a choice between ignoring the rest of the world, except when we kill terrorists, or occupying and rebuilding whatever society is unraveling. Leadership means a wise application of military power and rallying the world behind causes that are right. It means seeing our foreign assistance as a part of our national security, not something separate, not charity. When we lead nearly 200 nations to the most ambitious agreement in history to fight climate change, yes, that helps vulnerable countries, but it also protects our kids. When we help Ukraine defend its democracy, or Colombia resolve a decades-long war. That strengthens the international order we depend on. When we help 
African countries feed their people and care for the sick. It's the right thing to do, and it prevents the next pandemic from reaching our shores. You know, right now we're on track to end the scourge of HIV AIDS. That's within our grasp. And we have the chance to accomplish the same thing with malaria, something I'll be pushing this Congress to fund this year. That's American strength. That's American leadership. And that kind of leadership depends on the power of our example. That's why I will keep working to shut down the prison at Guantanamo. It is expensive, it is unnecessary, and it only serves as a recruitment brochure for our enemies. There's a better way. And that's why we need to reject any politics, any politics that targets people because of race or religion. Right, let me just say this. This is not a matter of political correctness. This is a matter of understanding just what it is that makes us strong. The world respects us not just for our arsenal. It respects us for our diversity and our openness and the way we respect every faith. His Holiness Pope Francis told this body from the very spot that I'm standing on tonight that to imitate the hatred and violence of tyrants and murderers is the best way to take their place. When politicians insult Muslims, whether abroad or our fellow citizens, when a mosque is vandalized, or a kid is called names, that doesn't make us safer. That's not telling it, what, telling it like it is. It's just wrong. It diminishes us in the eyes of the world. It makes it harder to achieve our goals. It betrays who we are as a country. We the people. Our Constitution begins with those three simple words. Words we've come to recognize mean all the people, not just some. Words that insist we rise and fall together. But that's how we might perfect our union. And that brings me to the fourth and maybe most important thing that I want to say tonight. The future we want, all of us want, opportunity and security for our families, a rising standard of living, a sustainable, peaceful planet for our kids, all that is within our reach. But it will only happen if we work together. It will only happen if we can have rational, constructive debates. It will only happen if we fix our politics. A better politics doesn't mean we have to agree on everything. This is a big country. Different regions, different attitudes, different interests. That's one of our strengths, too. Our founders distributed power between states and branches of government and expected us to argue, just as they did, fiercely, over the size and shape of government, over commerce and foreign relations, 
over the meaning of liberty and the imperatives of security. But democracy does require basic bonds of trust between its citizens. It doesn't, it doesn't work if we think the people who disagree with us are all motivated by malice. It doesn't work if we think that our political opponents are unpatriotic or are trying to weaken America. Democracy grinds to a halt without a willingness to compromise. Or when even basic facts are contested. Or when we listen only to those who agree with us. Our public life withers when only the most extreme voices get all the attention. And most of all, democracy breaks down when the average person feels their voice doesn't matter. That the system is rigged in favor of the rich or the powerful or some special interest. Too many Americans feel that way right now. It's one of the few regrets of my presidency that the rancor and suspicion between the parties has gotten worse instead of better. I have no doubt a president with the gifts of Lincoln or Roosevelt might have better bridged the divide. And I guarantee I'll keep trying to be better so long as I hold this office. But my fellow Americans, this cannot be my task or any president's alone. There are a whole lot of folks in this chamber, good people, who, who would like to see more cooperation, would like to see a more elevated debate in Washington, but feel trapped by the imperatives of getting elected, by the noise coming out of your base. I know, you've told me. It's the worst kept secret in Washington. And a lot of you aren't enjoying being trapped in that kind of rancor. But that means if we want a better politics, and I'm addressing the American people now, if we want a better politics, it's not enough just to change a congressman or change a senator or even change a president. We have to change the system to reflect our better selves. I think we've got to end the practice of drawing our congressional districts so that politicians can pick their voters and not the other way around. Let a bipartisan group do it. I believe we've got to reduce the influence of money in our politics so that a handful of families or hidden interests can bankroll our elections. And if our existing approach to campaign finance reform can't pass muster in the courts, we need to work together to find a real solution, because it's a problem. And most of you don't like raising money. I know. I've done it. We've got to make it easier to vote, not harder. We need to modernize it for the way we live now. This is America. We want to make it easier for people to participate. And over the course of this year, I intend to travel the country to push for reforms that do just that. But I can't do these things on my own. Changes in our political process, in not just who gets elected, but how they get elected, that will only happen when the American people demand it. It depends on you. That's what's meant by a government of, by, and for the people. What I'm suggesting is hard. It's a lot easier to be cynical. 
to accept that change is not possible. And politics is hopeless. And the problem is, all the folks who are elected don't care. And to believe that our voices and our actions don't matter. But if we give up now, then we forsake a better future. Those with money and power will gain greater control over the decisions that could send a young soldier to war or allow another economic disaster or roll back the equal rights and voting rights that generations of Americans have fought, even died to secure. And then, as frustration grows, there will be voices urging us to fall back into our respective tribes, to scapegoat fellow citizens who don't look like us or pray like us or vote like we do or share the same background. We can't afford to go down that path. It won't deliver the economy we want. It will not produce the security we want. But most of all, it contradicts everything that makes us the envy of the world. So my fellow Americans, whatever you may believe, whether you prefer one party or no party, whether you supported my agenda or fought as hard as you could against it, our collective futures depends on your willingness to uphold your duties as a citizen, to vote, to speak out, to stand up for others, especially the weak, especially the vulnerable, knowing that each of us is only here because somebody somewhere stood up for us. We need every American to stay active in our public life, and not just during election time, so that our public life reflects the goodness and the decency that I see in the American people every single day. It is not easy. Our brand of democracy is hard. But I can promise that a little over a year from now, when I no longer hold this office, I will be right there with you as a citizen, inspired by those voices of fairness and vision, of grit and good humor and kindness that have helped America travel so far. Voices that help us see ourselves not first and foremost as black or white or Asian or Latino, not as gay or straight, immigrant or native born, not Democrat or Republican, but as Americans first, bound by a common creed. Voices Dr. King believed would have the final word. Voices of unarmed truth and unconditional love. And they're out there, those voices. They don't get a lot of attention. They don't seek a lot of fanfare. But they're busy doing the work this country needs doing. I see them everywhere I travel in this incredible country of ours. I see you, the American people. And in your daily acts of citizenship, I see our future unfolding. I see it in the worker on the assembly line who clocked extra shifts to keep his company open. And the boss who pays him higher wages instead of laying him off. I see it in the dreamer who stays up late at night to finish her science project, and the teacher who comes in early, maybe with some extra supplies that she bought, because she knows that that young girl might someday cure a disease. I see it in the American who served his time made bad mistakes as a child, but now is dreaming of starting over. And I see it in the business owner who gives him that second chance. 
The protester, determined to prove that justice matters, and the young cop walking the beat, treating everybody with respect, doing the brave, quiet work of keeping us safe. I see it in the soldier who gives almost everything to save his brothers, the nurse who tends to him till he can run a marathon, the community that lines up to cheer him on. It's the son who finds the courage to come out as who he is, and the father whose love for that son overrides everything he's been taught. I see it in the elderly woman who will wait in line to cast her vote as long as she has to. The new citizen who casts his vote for the first time. The volunteers at the polls who believe every vote should count. Because each of them, in different ways, know how much that precious right is worth. That's the America I know. That's the country we love. Clear-eyed, big-hearted, undaunted by challenge, optimistic that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. That's what makes me so hopeful about our future. I believe in change because I believe in you, the American people. And that's why I stand here as confident as I have ever been that the state of our union is strong. Thank you. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. Thank you so much. If you're just joining us, welcome back. If you're joining us for the first time, we are live at the White House. We just all witnessed the president give his final State of the Union address. Uh, and what we're going to do right now is we're going to go back a couple of minutes to before the speech. All righty. Okay, so that was um, President Obama in his final address. look at the State of the Union address. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we're, once again, use the hashtag S-O-U-T all night long. Tell us what you thought of it. Uh, any, anything that you learned from tonight's event, make sure you use that hashtag. Okay, so uh, that was Terrence J. He said use a hashtag uh, SOTU, S-O-T-U, State of the Union. Um, it stands for State of the Union. So definitely check that out. You want to uh, give your responses. You can do that on Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, because, hey, today is the first day of the White House to be on Snapchat. <laughs> so definitely check that out. I'm going to finish out uh, Skylar Kalen's song, Take Control. Here we go. SkylarKalen.com. You're listening to LUTG.
Come on again.